Everyone say January 4th, 1998. What happened that day? That was the day that I was baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's 25 years ago. That's a long time. 25 years ago. I was hungry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I went to my room that day. I had asked previously, didn't receive it uh, a couple of times. And then January 4th, 1998, I got on my knees in my room and I read this little article on the side that says, if your earthly father is evil, he gives you good gifts. How much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So I said, Lord, I'm asking you again. And then I said, and I expect to speak with other tongues. Got on my knees about one minute later. I stuck out my tongue like Michael Jordan and I expected to speak in tongues and Man, the power of God came on me, and I started speaking in tongues, and I did not realize it. My mind had to play catch-up because my spirit was flowing. So your mind is always behind. It's your spirit man. So I received the empowerment at that day. And from that day forward, I began to speak in tongues, of course, and been practicing it for the last 25 years. But what was the purpose for that? The purpose of Pentecost. What's the purpose? Is the purpose just to speak in tongues? Is the purpose just to look cute, to look nice, to look spiritual? Of course not. The purpose of Pentecost is to be a witness. Now, so before we, we continue with that, we see that Israel celebrates seven feasts, or three major feasts, seven parties, I like to call it. Now, Israel observes the feast. Christ fulfills the feast. The church applies the feast. All right? So Israel observes it, they celebrate it, Christ fulfilled it, and the church applies it. Example, the first major feast is Passover. What's the first major feast? Okay, Passover is what? When Israel came out of Egypt. How many years were they in, in slavery? 430 years. And that day, they killed the lamb, applied the blood over the doorpost, and that day, God delivered them. Keeping his promise to Abraham, he set them free. Two to three million people were set free on Passover. Hallelujah. So Israel still celebrates that feast. They still observe that feast. They remember what God did for them when he delivered them from Egypt. Now, so Israel observes it. Christ fulfills it. Why? Because Christ Jesus is our Passover. We see in 1 Corinthians that the Apostle Paul says that Christ is our what? Passover. So he himself is the lamb that was slain for us. So Christ fulfilled that already to the full. And the church, us, that feast is applied in our lives. Why? Because the moment you receive Christ, you went from death to life. Spiritual death to spiritual life. From the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. So that feast was fulfilled in your life the day you received them. Hallelujah. Amen? Now, what's the next feast? The next feast is unleavened bread. What is unleavened bread? It's celebrated the same week of Passover. And on the unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread, they were commanded you cannot eat bread that's leavened. It has to be unleavened bread. Leaven is symbolic of sin. God was telling Israel, you ate the Passover lamb, and that same week, do not touch unleavened uh, leaven bread. No leaven in your house. Leaven symbolic of sin. So he was telling his people basically, listen, I just saved you. Do not touch sin anymore and get rid of sin in your life. There's not to be sin found in your house. So how is that fulfilled in Christ? Jesus himself was made sin with our sin on the cross, correct? He took your sin and my sin, and we took his what? Righteousness. So the feast is fulfilled in Christ because he became sin. Hallelujah. He was the leavened bread. He was unleavened, perfect, and sinless, and became leavened. He was made sin with your sin and my sin. How is that fulfilled in our lives? We receive the righteousness of Christ. We put away sin, and we receive his righteousness, and now we begin to walk in righteousness. And God's people said, what's the next feast? First fruits is celebrated the same week. And first fruits, that's when Israel, Israel brought the first grain of the harvest, of that harvest. They were to bring grain as an offering to the Lord. Every feast, you have to bring an offering. Now, what does that represent? You're honoring God. You're worshiping God. It's the first of the grains 
being offered to God. How is it fulfilled in Christ? He was the first fruit of the resurrection. Hallelujah. I said he was the first fruit of the resurrection. And the Bible says, if he was the first, he was the forerunner. He went before us as an example. The same way he was raised from the dead, you and I are going to be raised from the dead. He was just the first one to take part in the first fruit of that resurrection. So the, it's, it's going to be fulfilled in our lives on that day. Hallelujah. When he comes in the rapture. Now, the fourth feast is what? What we're celebrating today, Pentecost. Hallelujah. Pentecost is 50 days after uh, Passover. So you have Passover, and then you have is, is 49 days plus one, because it's seven weeks plus one. It's after the Sabbath, the Feast of Weeks is celebrated, which is 50th. We get the word 50th because it's a Greek word. Pentecost means 50th. So it's 50 days from the Sabbath, from the Feast of the Passover being celebrated. And you guys clear? Understanding? Okay. So in, in uh, Pentecost, it's called the Feast of Weeks. It's the first fruits of the wheat harvest. We just gather the first fruits of the grain. This is the wheat. So the wheat is gathered on the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost. They gather the wheat harvest. How is that fulfilled in Christ? Jesus is the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. He's the one that baptizes his people with the Holy Spirit and with power. Amen? John said, I baptize you with water, but he baptizes you with the Holy Spirit and power. So Jesus himself is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. And it was fulfilled when? On the day of Pentecost, when 120 apostles plus disciples were gathered in a room in prayer. And the wind came and the fire came on that day. And it was fulfilled that day. In them, Jesus baptized all of them with the Holy Spirit and fire. So that's how the church applies that. And that feast continues because every single believer has access to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Behold, I send the promise of what? My Father upon you. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are what? Endued with power from where? Yeah, where's this power coming from? It's coming from on high, brother. We're talking about a heavenly power. And Jesus is saying, it's a promise. It's, a pro it's the promise of who? Of the Father. How many know that when the Father promises something, he fulfills his promise? The Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the Son of man that he should repent. Has God not said and shall God not do? So when the Father promises something, it's guaranteed. It's done. Hallelujah. Because he can't lie. The Bible says it's impossible for God to lie. As long as you cooperate with the Lord, every promise he promised you will surely come to pass. Period. And God's people said, amen. So he says the promise of the Father. He told them, go to Jerusalem. Wait. Don't go preach repentance and remission yet. I'm telling you what to preach, but don't go do it yet till you be clothed with power. Endued means to be what? Clothed. It means to put on. It means to sink into a garment. Whoa. Another garment is going to come upon you. I said another garment is going to come upon you. We all know the Holy Spirit was with us before we were saved. When you were a heathen in the world, who brought you to the Lord? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was convicting you and not condemning you. He was convicting you. He was talking to you. Don't do that. Listen, do this. Seek the Lord. Accept the Lord. He was all over us, convicting us of our sin. Not condemning, but convicting. So he was with you before you were even saved. The day you got saved, he took, he, he, he relocated his address from being with you to being inside of you. Yeah, the day you got saved, he relocated. He made a new home, new address. Hallelujah. Yeah, he came on the inside of you. But the, Jesus here is saying he's, he was with you. He came in you when you received me, but now he needs to come upon you. Now, the importance of the Holy Spirit coming upon the believer. Because if we're going to preach repentance and remission, we need the power. We need the power. It says, until you be endued with power from on high. The word power there means dunamis. The word power there means dynamite. That means explosive might and ability is going to come upon the natural, regular believer. 
Not those just in the fivefold ministry, because God calls people into fivefold. You can't call yourself. He calls you into them. I'm talking about the regular blue collar believer. We will say blue collar from work, correct? They use the blue collar. The regular, you know, worker. The believer that works in the gas station. The believer that works in the school as a teacher, as an assistant teacher, as a medical assistant, as a nurse, as a doctor. It doesn't matter. As long as the Holy Spirit is in you, the promise of the Father, the Spirit of God will come upon you and empower you. And you shall be transformed into another man. Yeah, the scripture says in 1 Samuel, it says, The Spirit of the Lord shall come upon you, and you shall be turned into another man. Like another man, a completely different man than the way you were before. How many want to be transformed into another man? Unrecognizable. You go from a natural man, and when the power of God comes upon you, you, you become a superman. A superman. Why? Because the power of God transforms you. So the spirit in me is transforming me into the image of Jesus. So I can walk in the spirit. So I can walk in the fruit of the spirit. But the power on me makes me wild. Hallelujah. Makes me loud and wild. And very powerful, very energetic and quick. Hallelujah. That's what the anointing does. It takes someone who's shy and makes them bold. Someone who can't speak like Moses and he gives them a mouth to speak. Hallelujah. No excuses when the power of God comes upon you. Oh, I don't have an education. You don't need education when the power of God comes upon you, brother. You become a mighty man of God, a mighty woman of God. And God's going to raise up mighty men and women of God in these end times. But how? With the power. You shall be endued with power from on high. You shall be clothed and another garment is going to come upon you. How important is this? I know many of you know this because we preach this here. This is what we preach, the power of God. There's a lot of churches that don't believe in the power of God. So I pray whoever listens to this message, maybe a denomination that doesn't believe in the power of God, you better start believing in the power of God because in the end times, only the power of God is going to drive away devils. The finger of God is going to drive away, drive away devils. The seeker-friendly church, the church that doesn't believe in the power of God, listen, you need to repent, meaning rethink. Read the scriptures with fresh new eyes. Because if Jesus needed the power to preach, what makes you think you don't need the power to preach? Jesus was born of the Spirit, yes or no? You and I were born when mommy and daddy got together. But Jesus' earthly parents didn't get together. He was born from heaven, straight from heaven, was deposited in the womb of Mary by the power of God. So Jesus was born of the Spirit, lived in the Spirit, walked in the Spirit, but he didn't do no miracles. He walked by faith. He walked in truth. But when he got baptized in water, what happened? He was endued with power. He was clothed with power. A new garment came upon Jesus of Nazareth. It wasn't the regular Jesus of Nazareth anymore. It was super Jesus now. Power from on high came upon him. And that's why his own family couldn't recognize him. It, what's going on with Jesus? He's out of his mind. He, wasn't, he was out of his mind. Out of his natural mind. Yeah, we have the mind of Christ. When they tell you crazy, yeah, I know. I'm, I'm out of my mind. I have the mind of Christ now. The mind of Christ. I'm out of my mind. Yes, thank God I'm out of my mind. I have the mind of Christ now. And I operate like Jesus now. Think like Jesus. Walk like Jesus. Speak like Jesus. So this power transforms you. And every single believer from small to old needs the power of God. We all need the power of God. And verse 8 says, watch this. You shall receive what? Power. When the Holy Spirit has come where? Upon you means up on you. Hallelujah. He's going to come upon you and what? And you shall be what? Be a what? Come on. A witness to me where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Everywhere you go, you are witness for Jesus with the power of God. So Jesus said, I waited for the power. I received it when I got baptized in water. And you gotta, you're going to receive it in the upper room. Just wait there. Then preach repentance and remission of sins. And then go forth with my name. And use my name, and the power of God will flow through you. 
What happened on Pentecost? Well, you see it here. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had what? Fully come. They were what? Where? All in one place, in one accord. So they were all praying, seeking the Lord, praying for 10 days, calling upon God. And then we see verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind. What? And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And what happens? Then they appear to them, divided tongues as a fire. And one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them what? Utterance. So there we see, as they were waiting, came into the room. I mean, they were sitting down, expecting, hungry, thirsty, and all of a sudden, on the tenth day, They heard a sound from heaven. And when the Holy Spirit comes, brother, he comes with wind and he comes with fire and he comes with power. When the Holy Spirit comes, he comes with noise. Because it's a manifestation of his power. But when he leaves your life, he leaves silently. Because remember Samson? He didn't know that he lost the power. When he went to shake himself off, he realized the power was gone. The Spirit of God left quietly. When the dove leaves, he leaves quietly. But when he comes, he comes with noise. Hallelujah. When the power is manifested, it's noise. Because it's a manifestation, it's a demonstration of the power of God. So, what am I saying with all this? There's times when God will move with thunder, lightning, and fire. And there's other times he'll move gently like a gentle breeze. Do not get caught up with methodologies. A lot of people like being comfortable with a certain methodology. A certain way is manifesting. We cannot be, we have to be people of the Spirit. People who are led by the Spirit of God. If God wants to come in with noise, we move with noise. If God wants to come with quietness, we move with what? That's it. That's how you flow with the Holy Spirit. If he wants to move gently, then you move with, gent- with gentleness. If he wants to move like a lion, brother, we run all over the place. Are you with me? So it, don't get caught up. A lot of believers are caught up with how God is using someone. Oh, why they have to be so loud? Or oh, why they have to be so quiet? You're caught up with the, with, the, with the personality of the person. It's not the personality of the person. It's the power of God over the person. Yeah. Hallelujah. You can prophesy nice and quiet. Or you can prophesy, thus says the Lord. Don't get caught up with the methodology as long as what he says is from the Lord. Or he, she says is from the Lord. Because we're all different, yes or no? Different culture, different personality. Some are introverts, some are what? extroverts. Doesn't matter. The Holy Ghost will say, no, I'm only going to use extroverts. No. Or the Holy Spirit doesn't say, I'm only going to use introverts. No. He want, he's just looking for hungry people. He's looking for vessels. Empty vessels. Why empty? So he can fill them. And use them. So don't get caught with the methods or the way, you know, it's being done. Just see what are the results. Hallelujah. Just see what are the results. And, and let me tell you something. You could be an introvert, but when that fire of God hits you, Shyness becomes boldness. Shyness becomes boldness because you're transforming to another man. You're not the same man. You're someone else. When the power of God hits you, and listen, let me tell you something. Even if you're an introvert, if I put fire behind your buttocks, (laughs) you'll be the first one yelling and screaming. I said, what happened to this introvert? He's not quiet no more. Ah, why? Fire. Correct? Why? Fire. Fire. Yeah, that means when fire comes on you, (laughs) you shall be turned into another man. You're going to be loud, demonstrative, because the Spirit of the Lord changes everything about you. So they begin to speak with tongues. That was the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. They begin speaking in tongues. They empower. The manifestation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was speaking in tongues. But that's not the purpose for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The purpose for the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to be empowered, to be a what? A witness. So that when you speak about Jesus, the presence is released. When you speak about Jesus, the aroma is released. When you speak about Jesus, the anointing is released. 
All of a sudden, you speak it to people about Jesus, they cry. They're being touched. They say, oh, I feel something when you speak it. Why? It's the anointing flowing out of you. Because the anointing upon you is for someone else and not for yourself. The anointing in you is for yourself. The anointing on you is for someone else. That's why you can be going through problems and God still uses you. Oh, I'm going through all this problem. Yeah, okay, baby, don't worry. Get under the anointing and you'll forget about yourself and start ministering. The po- you, you, what do you think? I've been preaching for 20, 20 plus years. You think I haven't had problems? You never know. I come in and I keep ministering like nothing. Why? Because when the anointing come on me, my problems mean nothing in the, power, in the presence of God. You could be sick, pray for people, they'll be healed. You say, how is that possible? Because the anointing on me is not for me, it's for you. Hallelujah. I said, the anointing on you is for someone else. Oh, pastor, I'm going through problems. That's okay, baby, that's part of life. Hallelujah. Everyone goes through problems. Come on now. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Hallelujah. Yeah, walking through. I'm not pitching a tent there and living there. Passing through. Then I say bye-bye to my valley. I'm on my way to the mountaintop. Hallelujah. And what happens? They begin to mock them in verse 13, Acts chapter 2. Others said, oh, you're full of wine. You guys are drunk. Why? Because they were, something was happening with these men, Chris. They were there praying. (laughs) The wind came. They began speaking in tongues. Something happened to these men that did not happen prior. And the people that don't understand this, they say, oh, these guys are drunk. They're just drunk. What do you see on a drunk man? When someone is drunk, their look is affected, correct? They look different. What else is affected? They smell different. What else is affected? Their speech is different. The way they think is different. The way they walk is different. Are you with me? Everything about that person is different. Why? He's drunk. He's drunk. What happens to the Christian when the Christian is drunk with the power of God? He's going to look different. Huh? He's going to think different. He's going to speak different. He's going to walk different. And he's going to smell different. Everything about that man is transformed. The anointing is supernatural. The power of God is supernatural. When the, when the anointing came upon Samson, what did he do? He ripped the lion in two. It gives you, he gave him supernatural strength to do the impossible. What does the power of God do? It gives you supernatural power to do the impossible. Whatever impossibilities you feel in your life, with the power of God, it becomes possible. It becomes, because with God, all things are possible. With God. Without God, you're in trouble, brother. With God, all things are possible. All things are possible. So that supernatural power came upon Samson. A lion attacked. He grabbed that and ripped it into. That is not possible. How can you grab a lion and rip the thing? Supernatural strength came upon the man Samson. How about Elijah the prophet? Supernatural power God came out and he outran a horse. <sighs> See you on the other side. He was gone. Because it says the spirit of the Lord came up upon him. <sighs> World record holder, Elijah the prophet. is not in the record books. How? The power of God. And all these other instances of how God used people. How? The power of God. One experience always outweighs knowledge. Experience outweighs knowledge. Now your experience has to line up according to the word. Don't come telling me you have some experience I can't even find in the scriptures. I don't know what experience you had. You got to be in the book. Are you with me? So your experience has to line up to the word. But when you experience the word. And people don't believe that and say, no, that don't happen anymore. That happened in the past. What Bible are you reading? It's not this Bible. It's some other Bible, some other gospel. Paul said, I did not come to you with eloquence of speech. 
but I came in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Everyone say demonstration of the spirit and of power. Yeah, not eloquent words. This has nothing to do with your little eloquence. Remember the two preachers? One was reading Psalms 23. He read it eloquently. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He said it with his King James Version. Sounded so poetic. When he was done, here came another pastor, older man. He said, can I read Psalms 23? I know that we read it already, but can I reread it after the service? Sure, okay. He rereads it. The Lord is my shepherd. Everybody began to cry. Why? Because the man, they said, why come when he read it, they clapped. Eloquent. When you read it, they cry. He said, oh, because he was talking about the shepherd. I know the shepherd. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody one time told me, you're always talking about the Holy Spirit. I said, well, how can you not speak about someone you know? Hallelujah. 